Hi. Yeah, hello. And this is me talking live on the internet once more. Hey, hello. Welcome back. Uh, happy Valentine's Day to those who celebrate. Uh, happy Cheap Candy Eve to those who don't. Um, but here we are going to be talking about the most appropriate uh, Valentine holiday, holiday uh, thing we could talk about. Horror? Mm, close enough. We're talking about called Cthulhu, as you may read in the stream title. Let me put myself up on stream. Hi. Hello. It's me. Um, Call of Cthulhu basically is actually appropriate for February because uh, Call of Cthulhu is was the original H.P. Lovecraft story uh, was written in February about 95 years ago, I believe. So this is the 95th anniversary of Call of Cthulhu, the original story. Um, so to celebrate that, that we're going to plan out and play um, an adventure from Chaosium's uh, uh, starter set. And in particular, we're going to be playing out their, basically we're going to be planning out their second scenario known as Edge of Darkness. So, um, in brief, Call of Cthulhu is a much more it's compared to what other stuff we've run, this is definitely a much more pulpish uh, type of game. Um, it does generally get run in a 1920s, 1930s setting. Um, some of them will run later and do 40s, maybe even up into the 50s. Some of them will run earlier, World War One, 1910s, uh, 1900s era. But it's very definitely kind of shaped by that time. And I'm going to keep talking. I need to make sure that there we go. Okay. My headset, my side tone was being really loud. And it just reaches a point where you're starting to hear yourself and distract yourself. Um, in any case. Um, so this is very much, it has, it's, it's set in that era. And so a lot of the characters you have... A lot of the examples, the setting, the whole feel of it kind of revolves around that idea of that time period and what that time period means. Um, for example, as you can see, this adventure starts in 1923. Um, so your pre-depression, swinging 20s, um, but it does allow you to use a lot of the because when you set something in a modern horror, modern horror has to deal with, well, the first thing modern horror always has to deal with is at any given particular point, uh, what did you sense in captions? Uh, wow, okay. Uh, I'm going to stop looking at those. Um, but uh, in any case, the first problem that basically most modern horror has to deal with is People carry around these phones everywhere, everywhere they go. They have these, they have these phones with them, and so they can call and get help, get a Disney or click a button, and the car will pick them up no matter where they are. Um, they can always call the police. They can order help, order help. They can order food. They can do whatever. They can look stuff up. They can research stuff. Um, and so, a lot of modern horror has to immediately deal with that. So by setting something back and dealing with stuff in the 1920s, 1910s, you get to deal with a little bit more of that forced helplessness, which is kind of the key for uh, key for basically a solid or type experience is that feeling of powerlessness of that you, you are able to act, but your actions don't amount to much. They don't get you out of the situation. And Call of Cthulhu in particular kind of famously thrives on that because the idea behind Call of Cthulhu in general, and it's going to vary from adventure to adventure. Um, some Call of Cthulhu adventures are going to be basically more action oriented. Some are going to be more mystery oriented, but generally the theme behind it all is that there is a unstoppable, all powerful force out there in the universe and your player characters are brushing against the merest edge of it and trying to deal with what they discover there and escape with their lives and basically, as the famous goes, escape with their sanity. 
Um, and so playing one of these games or running one of these games as a GM requires the GM to be in a slightly different mindset than from your basic uh, dungeon crawl, for example. Because a dungeon crawl is definitely much more of a you want your players to feel in control. You want your players to basically feel like the situation is something that they can take steps, they can handle it, they can deal with it. Um, that as long as they keep going forward, eventually basically you're going to level them up and the challenges they're going to face are going to be appropriate for that level. Um, whereas with Call of Cthulhu, um, you're definitely going to be playing on that edge. You don't want them to just be completely shut out. The first thing they encounter murders all of them, pack up your bags, go home, because that's a really short session and no one's really going to have any fun with that. Um, but on the flip side, you don't want them to feel like they're just steamrolling the adventure. There's nothing out there which could possibly stop them unless you're toying with them or you're playing with something in particular. If, basically, if you're doing that, you want them to have that same feeling but only but have in the back of their mind that, hey, this is too easy. Hey, something is going on. Hey, what basically what's coming what's coming to get me? Basically, what when does this when does this end, as it were? Um and so but more appropriately, a lot of what basically more basically we're seeing people for what we're talking about here, a lot of what Call of Cthulhu plays up against is the the mystery of the unknown. That your players are somewhat clued in, um, but not maybe not 100% clued in. They don't know everything because, again, knowing everything in Call of Cthulhu is a really short trip to uh, the local sanatorium, as it were. Um, but but they, they, basically, they generally, they're trying to figure out what's going on as they progress through the adventure. Um, generally, it starts with an inciting incident, um, something that kind of pulls them in but seems normal on the surface, but then quickly starts to spiral downwards and keeps them just on that edge of being in control or not being in control. Um, so looking at this scenario, uh, this is from the uh, Call of Cthulhu starter set. They have a really nice starter set out there. Um, both Roll20 and I don't think Founder has anything for it, but I think Fantasy Grounds does as well. Um, have modules for this if you're looking to play it online. You can also basically drive through RPG or going to the Chaosium site. Either one of those will have basically essentially have a kind of a box set for you. Um, a digital box set. There's probably a physical box set as well. Um, but the digital box set has a lot of what you need. Um, this isn't a system that requires a lot of special dice or anything like that. This isn't like uh, Fantasy Flight's uh, Edge system. Um, or, is it Edge? Genesis. That's the name I'm going for. Genesis or their uh, L5R type system where dice are kind of weird. Basically, they want you to have specialized dice so they'll so you a starter set, which will have specialized dice and tokens and other stuff. Um, so, uh, basically we'll keep back to that. Basically, the physical things. But in terms of digital stuff, um, this has a quick, quick walkthrough to get you as the keeper up to speed. Keeper, by the way, is the name of the of what they call GMs in uh, Call of Cthulhu. Um, Call of Cthulhu is all those games that. A lot of the older games wanted to break, separate themselves from D and D in every way possible because they didn't want to be seen as writing on the D and D's coattails. And so, while D and D had DMs and basically to a lesser extent GMs, uh, kind of hanging around in their space, a lot of the game systems that came out, or a lot of the earlier TTRPGs that came out, uh, welcome back, twenty. A lot of them chose to give the person who is running the game a different name, so as to further separate themselves from that, basically from that myth, basically from that uh, mindset. So, story basically, uh, World of Darkness has storyteller instead of GM. 
um, and Call of Cthulhu has Keeper of Ancient Lore, which they shortened to Keeper. Um, and so the basically the Quick Start Guide has a quick thing for the Keeper um, to kind of get a, a, basically a newbie Keeper up to speed on what the Call of Cthulhu universe is like, what the Call of Cthulhu game is like, and how it's played, and it even has a little, <coughs> excuse me, um, has a little uh, Call of Cthulhu, basically, essentially choose your own adventure. Um, basically, it might be, if for those people who happen to know about it, it's closer probably to those, uh, the lone wolf adventures, um, or fighting sorcery, uh, in terms of the fact that when you would, you'll make a choice, but then it'll ask you to roll dice, and essentially play, basically play through a mini little game with the book being the keeper, as it were. Uh, you're, so you're rolling dice, you're understanding what the rules are, and it's walking you through that, and it's giving you a little mini walkthrough, which is nice. Um, and then it has a quick book, which gives you a basically understanding of how the rules work for Call of Cthulhu. Then it has a scenario guide for some quick starting up scenarios, um, which are which is the book we're looking at here. Um, it has three scenarios in it, and the scenarios, as you go deeper into them, um, give basically you get less and less kind of hand holding. Uh, like the first the first scenario has a lot of okay, as the keeper, this is what you need to know, this is what you need to know, this is what you should be looking for. Scenario two backs off of that a little bit. And uh, then scenario three is completely just kind of, it gives you the scenario as presented um, and lets you basically kind of assumes that you now at this point know what you're doing. So it's a good, it's a good way of getting into the game. Um, it does basically tell you at the start um, exactly how many players they expect you to have. So this one expects four, two to, uh, two to five players plus the keeper. So three people minimum, six people maximum. Um, and it tells you how many play, how much play time. So this one is a longer one, one to three sessions. Now, for our purposes, we are unlikely to probably get through the entire scenario before we move on to something else, uh, because the purpose of these streams uh, aren't... <laughs> no, no, get the soda. Um, the purpose of these streams is not to uh, talk necessarily, basically play through an entire game, as fun as that is, but to give you kind of glimpses and tastes and understanding of how Lorelink, the system that we basically, or basically our campaign managed GM management tool system, how that works with various different systems. Um, as much as I'd love for this to be an actual play channel, uh, a lot of the people on here have jobs and lives, and so we don't have as much time as we would love to to sit down and play four-hour sessions every week uh, to actually get through an entire scenario like this, but regardless of that, let's basically let's talk about what let's talk about what we're here to talk about. Let's talk about Lorelink. So lives, ha! Ah. Says the one person who very definitely has a life, um, and uh, which is which cut which tends to cut short Tuesdays. Uh, so in any case, um, so. So we're presented with, basically, in terms of, um, for the, like I talked about earlier, Call of Cthulhu tends to play out more mysterious. Um, and what that means is, as a keeper, in this case, I freely apologize, I will probably use the terms keeper, GM, kind of interchangeably. The weather around here has been doing weird ups and downs, and that has meant that I get fun signage drainage, which means that the back of my throat is my throat is raw. So you will see me occasionally taking brief breaks to cough and otherwise do others basically and chug liquids as it were. Um so um basically one of the key parts about this being a mystery is the fact that you kind of want to give your players less railroading. Like, there's a little bit of railroading, which is going to be kind of understandable. You're not going to want your players to, if the setting is set in, in this case, Massachusetts. Um, to suddenly decide that this mystery really needs them to go investigate Chicago or 
LA or something like that. You could let them do that, but you're more and more off track and more kind of escaping. You you want a little bit of pressure on the players. You want a little bit of time is ticking, things are happening that kind of keeps them forced to a particular trap, a particular sandbox, as it were. But you want them to kind of feel like they can move around in that sandbox because you kind of the big thing is going to be kind of blunt. You want them to feel that the choices that are leading to their doom are the choices which they are making. If the GM is really describing the horrible fates of their characters to them, your characters don't have that agency and it's less scary. It's You're just sitting there. You're just like, oh, okay. Yeah, well, that, that sucks for those people. that They're having a terrible life, but I'm not in control of that. No matter what I do, basically the GM is the story, the keeper in this case is just taking away my agency. Um, and so it doesn't really matter. Um, so you want them to feel like they basically you want them to be able to poke at stuff, to push at stuff, to have successes, to feel like they may be going outside the bonds, that they're discovering things, but you want that feeling of inevitable. You're, they're being led towards, drawn towards a conclusion which they may or may not make it out of. Um, you want that doubt, but you want that feeling, the fact that they are that they are pushing through, uh, that they are the ones guiding their way through this. And so what that means in this particular case is how I would approach this is, oops, sorry. in this particular case, the setup is that the player characters are approached by a uh, by a mutual acquaintance that they all know who calls them from on their deathbed and says, I have something, I've been keeping something a secret for 40 years. I need you to come and listen to me because I feel like you you will know what to do. I need to confess this. And what basically he confesses the fact that he and a group of friends 40 years prior messed with something they shouldn't have and set about events into motion which have brought something horrible into this world. And they've begun to realize the fact that the thing that they brought in is merely waiting for them all to die so it can be released and do horrible things in the world. Um, and as he is dying, he realizes that he needs to let somebody know, basically he's put, he's put this off long enough. He's tried to deny it. He's tried to kind of push it out of his mind, but he realizes that now he has to make it, he has to do something about it. And so he is going to give information to the player's characters who are then basically then kind of sets them on a course. Um, so. So what that means is, from a keeper standpoint, um, I am going to essentially put a bunch of different, you know, the, the scenario, more particularly, puts a bunch of different kind of clues and actions, and then puts an inevitable conclusion, and that's the situation that it sets up for the uh, keeper is, here's the sandbox. At the center of the sandbox is essentially inevitable doom. It's sitting in the center of it, and the players are eventually going to get drawn into that one way or another. Your job as the keeper is going to be basically letting them know about that and basically kind of pushing them towards that, as it were. But there's a bunch of other stuff in this sandbox that they can go, they can research, they can look at, they can basically spend some time basically either activating whether they're actively avoiding the doom as it were or just trying to get more information so that they have a better chance um and like we said we said earlier this is a one to three session type adventure and it's a call of Cthulhu adventure is likely going to be a multi-session uh event um and so how i would end up setting this up is I would focus this in on using sessions essentially as my center point for the adventure. Um, so 
sessions and timelines are probably the two things I would use because um, it is going to be a ticking clock and a timeline is going to be good for that. You're going to have days and other stuff. We'll talk about that in a bit. But the sessions, I feel like, is kind of a good good starting point. So what you basically, a session, what's, what a session lets you do. Um, so let's say, we'll give this one the generic name of first session. Um, and basically how we may want to set this one up is we give it a date, uh, TV23, Game Master, Dungeon Master, Storyteller, Keeper, all our valid characters, yes. Thank you. Um, but we'll create an introductory session. Um, And so what we will end up with um, is basically, so sessions let you set up, you can basically let you set up essentially a centralized piece of information about, um, basically about a game session that you sit down and you basically you have with your uh, players. Um, so that is going to be basically be a, place where you can store all the information about what you think might happen in the session or what you think basically what you want to have on hand for a session. It also gives you a basically gives you a nice place to record what actually happens. And the reason why I'm saying for this kind of mis mystery sandbox type approach that basically focusing in on the session makes the most sense is that unlike a dungeon crawl where a lot of the time basically you you could kind of you basically you have a map and the map is what's going to inform you of where your players have been, um, especially if you're using an online tool, for example. Um, a lot of like basically you're going to reveal rooms, et cetera, et cetera, and you can you could tell what progress has been made in the dungeon by where the player characters last are. Okay, they're in room basically A five, and your session thing is probably just going to be notes on the things that they did in the other rooms. Okay, they did get this item, they did get this item, they let this person free, they didn't let this person free. Um, they insulted this duke, they didn't, basically, they... And so, it's just going to be kind of a quick focus, you're going to look at that, you're going to keep going on, and basically continue, basically, the locations are going to kind of be the center of what that is. But for this mystery type application, um, what we're going to do is we're going to create all of the clues and other things that the players might want to get into, and we're going to essentially list them all here in this session. So looking at this, uh, looking back to the PDF really briefly, um, basically looking through here, you're going to see that basically, so you have a dark secret, which is going to be the players talking to the, uh, the dying friend, You've got some handouts and other stuff. Um, if you do, lots of handouts. That's something that's guys. I was going back to one thing that Call of Cthulhu loves doing is it loves bringing players into the um, into the setting and scenario through lots and lots of handouts. Um, and so basically, because it loves that physicality of players. Uh, being handed things, basically, basically having that information in a format that they can look at, they can decide, basically, and then they decide what they're going to do with that information. Um, and basically, because a lot of times it's a dark secret or something like that. And so, do they share that with the rest of the group? Do they keep that to themselves? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And having the physicality of that helps them helps them do that. So. Basically, a, basically a tip, a, a, a lot of time, basically a tip for playing Call of Cthulhu games is even if you could buy a digital version, um, either print these out or use the, basically if you're doing a digital version, have these available as images, either basically if you're using Lorelink, obviously you could upload them as images inside of Lorelink um, and then have them available to either send to players or things like that and whatever whatever means you are using to play your online game. Like 
Roll20 and Foundry and even Fantasy Grants have handout functionality built into them. Uh, if you're playing it on Google Meet, you may, maybe, maybe you have a window that you use or a Dropbox or something like that where you pull these out of your lore link. You pull them out, you pull the images out of your lore links, uh, save, and then put them into a Dropbox, which is shared with all the players. Uh, or basically shared with just individual players. If you're doing a, you're wanting to keep things more private, you could have individual Dropbox, Google Drive, whatever online storage you want to use. Um, storage that you basically, you place certain things in there for particular players so that those players can look at them. Basically, it still have that same feeling of, this is something that my character knows and no one else knows and I have to decide what to do with it because I have this information in a limited form. I have to look at it. I have to communicate it. Um, I can choose to intentionally leave things out or I could tell everything and risk right, basically loosening people's grasp on the world a little bit more based on what's in these notes. Because again, all of these things are right on the outside of human comprehension. Um, but you can see here, there's this avenue, basically there's next steps. Um, and then avenues of research. Um, and what that basically what that is is now that they've been, they've been presented with the problem at hand, there is some kind of a line that, that basically malignant and an entity that exists in this basically in this case a farmhouse, uh, which is located outside of town, and they know that it will possibly be escaping soon, but they're also been given a box full of leads, essentially. Um, there's a box in there that has some symbols on it. They know that there's basically there are some people who have died related to this. Um, there are resources, basically there are resources, they could just do their own research at a library or something like that. Um, and so what I would be doing as a storyteller, or sorry, storyteller, I picked completely the wrong one. As a keeper, is that I'm going to create some quick events here, and I'm going to pretty much basically the first one is obviously going to be the basically that the deathbed confession. So this is basically the confession of uh, Rupert Mebu. Starting from that, so that's good. That's going to be your first major event that that's going to get the unskippable, and you're going to put information in there about you're going to maybe attach those hand basically maybe those basically the handouts. Maybe you're going to basically attach create the various items which are in there, which are in the box, um, and you'll attach that all to that event. Um, and but then after that, basically what the players do next is entirely up to them. Unless you are basically, and you should make it up to them. It should just, they should just literally be kind of handed this ominous task. They should be told, essentially, doom is coming. You have been given, you have been told, basically, you have been told you are the ones who can stop it. What do you do with this information? And let each of them deal with it however their characters are going to deal with it. But you're going to want to provide them essentially avenues for that um because sometimes players come to the table and they'll be, be presented with something like that and they'll get overwhelmed or something like that um welcome back to money um they'll be they'll just be like uh i don't know what and you could be like well you've got this you've got that um and so you can guide them to it but this case so what you're doing here is you're recording stuff like uh, investigate. So we're like we're investigating uh, one of the things there. So let's quickly show you what I'm doing in here. Basically, quite a quick event, which is investigate Marion Allen's death. Um, you've got the investigate the box. So again, back investigate the box. Yeah. 
Cyber Vagrants. Boom. That is the back of this. Um, and then basically, you can research at the library. So, research at the library. Um, see if there's anything there for work in here. I think those are the major was it library. Yep. Okay. So you've got you've got those major events, and then you have, of course, um, kind of a might investigate, investigate the farmhouse, and this one is going to kind of be a much bigger. The much bigger event is going to encompass a lot of other stuff underneath it, but we'll basically we would use basically investigate the farmhouse as just kind of a start for if they just want to go when they want to look, but not necessarily engage with the uh, uh, oh, see the crime. So I've created, the reason why I've created all these different events um, is that when I go into my session, I'm going to want to uh, go to that. And then I can associate those events. Research at the library. Death. Let's get the wooden box. Let's get the wooden box. So, uh, basically, now that I've associated those events, what basically what this allows me to do is now the session essentially becomes a because of these completed list here, essentially becomes kind of a checklist for what the party has and hasn't done. Um, and so if we come to, we come to the session, basically this is the first session. So they're going to come through, they're going to complete the deathbed confession because that's the start of the adventure. Um, and then the players are like, oh, well, I'm really interested about basically that he's been, he mentioned that one of his friends died. Let's go do research into that. And you can essentially run the rest of the session. They give you a little bit of information on there, depending on how much effort you want to put into it. Um, and how interested the players are in pursuing things and pushing on things. Um, you can essentially run the rest of the session just looking into the into the murder, basically, or death, rather, of Marion Allen. Marion Allen. Um, so, basically, you basically, that player talks, looks into it, basically, you're talking through that, you're having an investigation, you're having a session, and basically the session ends, but They've they've gone through all of that. You kind of you check that off. So now that when you come back next week and you want to or next day or however you're running your sessions, um, you're going to want this. You're going to essentially start an additional session. If you're going to start a new session, um, but you want to keep track of what they have and have it done. And you could basically using sessions, you could essentially do two things here. I select all of these, or I, I could select all of them. If I wanted to just copy them all from uh, basically this one, I can then create a, I can move them to a new session. I can move them to an existing session if I've already created one, or I can copy them to an existing session or a new session. So what that lets me do is if I want to copy them to a new session, for example, I can come through and be like, okay, and four days have passed, and so now it's April 26th. 1923. So that. So now if I go to sessions, I can go basically when I'm going to start that second session, 
I can see basically I can immediately start back up to sex and session knowing what things they've looked into, what crimes they've looked at, basically what clues rather than crimes, what clues they have looked at. And I can use this as an easy tick box of, okay, what have they done? What is still available to them? What are some of the options? I don't have to flip back through the PDF or the guide again to go, okay, what are the other things they could possibly be doing? Because the players may also be a little bit of like, oh, okay, it's been a week, a month, depending on how often your group meets. Um, they come back in and they're like, okay, so what were we doing? And you may want to basically, when you're calling out in your initial summary, you can call back out some of these things like, oh, and basically don't forget, you still have that golden box. Um, what have you is basically does request you may recall something happening at the library or reading something at the library, which briefly basically briefly uh, connected to that. Uh, and they can go back to that. And you can also inside of the event itself, you can add notes. There's a note button here. And you can add a note like player one. Uh, use contact in the place to get the autopsy report. I can't spell. There we go. And then you take a head out uh, the four five. Just player one who didn't go. And so now you now you have track of that note uh, in terms of basically you could basically when you're reviewing your basically when you're coming back in and you're doing your review before the game starts, you can be like, okay, basically now you have that session stuff all set up for you. Basically, at the end of the session, you copy it all into the second session, and you know, basically, okay, I know they did that. You know, you could, you know, they look at these two um, for notes and things like that to see what the player characters did. And you know, they'll look at these um, to see what the setup is, to be familiar with it, in order to run it um, for the players when they, basically, when they come and they sit down and they say, oh, hey, I want to basically, I remember last time something about, looking up stuff in the library, so my character wants to go to the library and look at things. Um, and so you could use these, use this uh, research, use this session of associated events to do that. Um, the locations is something else you could use as well. If there is a set of different locations, like like I had investigate the farmhouse and here, um, if, it's a, if it is a setting which has a lot of different locations, for example, this is as set in a, uh, as always, the fictional town of uh, Arkham. Um, basically, around Miskatonic University, and maybe there's a basically maybe there's a bunch of different buildings that they can they can visit, things like that. You want to keep track of things that way. Basically, you can associate the locations and do something similar. Or you can keep track of, yes, they went to the university. Yes, they went to basically you can have something like in a more generic setting. So basically you could have a crime scene. Um, and you can keep track of that, and be like, okay, they went to the university. Yes, they didn't go to the crime scene. Okay. Um, or they went to basically you keep track of it that way. Um, and you can do the same thing where you can copy all of those. Um Note the fact that uh, basically, if you want to go through and you want to copy events, then you can go to copy locations. And so you're not having to create a new session the second time. You could do select all and then move, copy them to an existing session, which is the session that they created in the you created in the previous one. Same thing with game objects in terms of your creating um, certain pieces of evidence. Maybe you want them to pick up, like the golden box we talked about. Maybe something you want to create. <laughs> Excuse me. You may want to create the uh, handouts as different game objects. Maybe they're items. Maybe they're just basically maybe they're items or something like that. And you want to keep track of those. That way, you can tell. Uh, 
game object item we'll just call it and that one and I could associate that with an image above the handout which I think I have uploaded in here already no I have the maps in here already so, so if I have one of the if I have one of the images loaded as a handout I could do it there but again that's okay. That's right. You can't do that for game object yet because we didn't add the completed tag for that. So if that's something you'd be interested in, and if you're watching this, you're like, ah, but that's great. Maybe this would be something you'd want. That's the only reason why we go through these things and we play through these things and we get feedback from people is so that when we counter something like that, where it's like when we originally did it, basically maybe completed basically completed game objects didn't make as much sense, so we didn't add it. But maybe if you're a Call of Cthulhu player and you're like, no, 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 I basically oh, I like keeping track of handouts this way. You can also keep track of handouts as events. Um, but if you wanted to keep track of handouts this way and you still want the completed tag and you wanted to copy them and move them, let us know. Um, this is the basically the somewhat basically re re repetitive pitch during all of these uh, all of these videos and sessions that the, we do have a alpha going on currently for a little bit longer. There will be some news coming out about that where the alpha is the alpha is now on a ticking clock. I can say that there will be a, there will be a, there, there will come a time in the near future where we will be shutting down the alpha, um, and getting ready for new and exciting other things. Um, so if you're still interested in, uh, basically taking part in the alpha, basically giving us feedback based on what we've got here and what you've done, um, feel free to hit up the link that, uh, twenty hopefully just posted in the chat, um, and. Look into that and give us feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Um, but in any case, to keep talking about uh, Call of Cthulhu. So, in terms of basically, this is this. I feel like the sessions is a good way of keeping everything together, keeping it all basically, basically keeping track of what they've done and what they haven't done. That way, it's a much more open, slightly less linear. Um, I notice I don't put numbers on these. I don't have a particular order on them. It's just some things can be done, some things can't be done, basically, or not done yet. Um, because again, I feel like Call of Cthulhu lends itself more to that. Um, basically, in terms of in terms of how the GM approaches it, in terms of you're not forcing them down a event one happens, then event two, like the Pathfinder game we did last week. It's very definitely a clear chain of events that your player that the players went through. The players get called up basically gets called to an adventure captain. They go to the they go to the location. They meet the bad they meet the bad person. The, the bad person then may challenge them to events, or in the case of our group, may get attacked on the spot because one member of the group may decide the fact that they didn't want to wait for diplomacy to happen. Um you're just in that. Go check our YouTube channel and see just exactly how chaotic things can get when your players just do their own things. This is always the fun of being a being a GM or storyteller. Ah, thank you for that. Um, but and then after that, you go to basically you go to this room. You get the items. You deal with the traps or don't deal with the traps. Again, watch the video. It's great fun. Thing was. Things went wrong spectacularly. It was one, definitely one of those situations where as a GM where you set up a situation, you're like, okay, this is going to be the difficult part, and this is going to be the easy part, and that is the way it's going to happen. And you basically, you know, and then your players come in and say, no, 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 this is going to be the easy part, and this thing, which should be relatively easy to deal with, is going to be absolutely close to wiping the party levels of chaos because that's what players do to your games and that's the joy and the fun of playing them um and that's the reason why we set up basically when we're setting up something like this in call of cthulhu <laughs> yes yes there was a whole lot of chaos happening and players going but that's not what we were talking about doing that's not what we've planned it oh oh no things are happening now we must deal with them <laughs> yes, the fighter decided that the phoenix disappearing meant that the phoenix disappeared and was gone forever. Just because it went somewhere else didn't mean anything. Um, in any case, um, 
chaos is the reason. Kate Visky jokes about chaos in and Call of Cthulhu aside. Um, chaos is the reason why I like setting up this thing as a session in terms of keeping track of what happens because something like investigate someone's death or doing research at the library might in your head be a relatively straightforward idea. You might think the players are going to go to the library. They know what they're looking for. They're looking for information on one of one of one of maybe two or three different events. And you're like, it's a library visit. They're going to go there. The worst that can happen is if they pull the wrong books, you read something bad. And so, you know, that happens. And it's going kind of, to Basically, you deal with sanity loss or things like that. But then one of your players might decide the fact that when they discover something in a book, they might decide that that book shouldn't be on the shelves anymore. Um, or they might decide that they need to have this information just for themselves. Um, hey, basically, Extra Life Charity. Cool. But we will need to update that date. Um but in any case, basically the players will be at the library and they'll decide that the book shouldn't be on the shelves and they need to keep this book and then decide to try to steal the book from the library. And basically you could start playing Yakety Sax immediately after that when they fail every stealth roll, get chased by the police, and so now you're having to deal with the fact that your, your player characters are on the run for the police for having stole something from the Miskatonic Library. Um, and you have to deal with that basically in all your future interactions. And so that's why it's always good you have these, when you go in here, you can, you have these notes, um, that you can keep track of and be like, okay, no, basically you have your players as well. You could, you could create the players and have individual notes on them. And so you're going to want to keep track of the fact, especially in a game like this, where everyone, everyone's character is definitely their own independent thing. They're not as... Uh, I'm trying to think of the right word. Basically, Call of Cthulhu is still cooperative. You are, it's all of you, basically, in, in a sense. It is, all of you are in the same basket. Uh, all of you are in the same boat, as it were. But unlike D and unlike D and D and Pathfinder, which generally encourages players that all of you have all of you have oars, all of basically all of you are going to steer the boat in a general direction to get from point A to point B and do whatever you need to at point A and point B. Call of Cthulhu does a lot of hands out five people and puts five people in the boat and hands out three oars. And then looks at the players and be like, well, you decide who's the best at rowing and who should be, who should decide where you're going. Or we'll put you in that same boat, give you three oars, and then give you two days of food for five people, but ten days of food for uh, two people, as it were. Um, and make you go, oh, well, maybe I don't like that other person. Maybe I don't trust that other person. What have they? Been, what books have they been reading? That person read something in a book and immediately ran out of the library with it, just basically stealing it. They seemed a little bit different. They've been acting a little weird. Do I trust them? Do I basically? And so you're going to have a little bit more player, basically player backs. I won't say backstabbing necessarily, but secret keeping. You're going to have a little bit more. Players are going to have their own individual takes on the situation, and things are going to. Uh, build up on them as every player has the whiskey has their own background and their own secrets and their own reason for being there um for example one of the games i played of call of cthulhu at gen con this last year there was a great um cliff danger and the cave of the spider woman I, that's not the exact title but it was something close to a very very awesome pulpy title um and all of the characters were all playing actors in a pulp uh silent film one of the serial types and each character was given a sheet and on the sheet gave them a little bit of backstory about what their particular character's take on this entire situation was and everybody had something on somebody else and had slightly different relationships with everybody else and all of those built in towards the finale because the, it's, it's a good it's a good keeper, and it's, it's a good scenario writer. You 
build all of those up and you push them all together and you rub those together and you make sparks and maybe you set the building on fire so now you're having to deal with this unknowable horror coming into the building and the building's on fire and you're not certain that you want everybody that's in the building to escape but you're pretty certain you don't want the want the unknowable horror on the other side to break through because that just means doom for everybody so you're going to be using things like players and things like that to keep track of those type of notes as well. You're going to be adding in, you're going to want to keep track of what each of the players are, what the relationship to the other players are, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other thing, which, may, which is going to be useful for Call of Cthulhu, because like I talked about earlier, you want a sandbox type environment because you want them to kind of feel like they have some freedom that they're trying to push out at the boundaries, that they're trying to make themselves better, that they can prepare themselves for what's going to happen. But at the same time, they know they're kind of fighting against something much more powerful than them. But you still want some pressure on them. And a lot of times in a Call of Cthulhu type adventure, where that pressure comes from is time um and call of cthulhu basically generally tends to let you know that um <coughs> hmm. of course as soon as i start talking a lot my throat decides it's been fine all day that no no all that irritation is going to show up right now in my cough drops or in the other room eh, it's fine so for example um Basically, one of the things here for you're doing some studies in the library, the amount of time taken to decipher the kind of things is 1d4 days. Um, you basically, but doing something else could add additional add additional time to the process. So you're keeping track of time. You are essentially giving the players this sensation of an hourglass. Basically, you're trying to give them the, the feel of uh, basically essentially an hourglass that you have as soon as you tell them that basically so and so has died, you have the box. You know this horror is coming. You you're essentially kind of flipping the hourglass on the table. Probably not physically, uh, though. There are some good adventures that do do that. One of the ones we ran uh, a while ago for an extra life game, uh, the ca the Castle of Strahd, actually had a physical timer, uh, which helped to add some fun pressure, but. You're using that um, that time pressure to add something into the adventure that is going. You have to keep moving. You have to keep going. You cannot be a hundred percent fully prepared for what's going to happen. You have to make choices. You have to sacrifice some things and be like, okay, we have enough time to do this, but we don't have enough time to do this and this. And doing this may give us information, but can we actually follow up on that? Or, okay, well, we need, we have a bunch of time, but that means we may need to split the group so that some of us can take care of this and some of us can take care of that. Oh, but that means that we're now going into unknown danger with less resources on it, and we don't know whose skills are going to be the best for each situation. Um, so, helping to keep track of that. Um, is going to be the idea of don't split the party unless it's necessary or the Davinsky or you know sometimes you just have to those are the best moments where you're like you know it's a, we know that this is a terrible idea but there are no other better ideas um, so for this game you might have two different timelines you might have a historical timeline there's a lot of time um Basically, events prior to games. So a lot of times you may have a situation where um, you can basically you will end up with a uh, sorry, my brain just blanked over way. Basically, things basically a lot of times what happens before these basically in a game of Call of Cthulhu something like that is. Events have happened prior to the party getting there. Um, things have been already set in motion. 
and the players are essentially coming in right at the end and trying to slow down, stop, or reverse what has already basically essentially happened. A lot of times it's a, in the distant past, a group of archaeologists opened this tomb, and when they did so, basically unleashed a curse, which has slowly been killing them off one by one, or... Like in this story, a group of a group of students at a nearby university uh, basically unleashed a horror basically as part of their oh basically their fun fun jokey uh, arcane practices, and then a series of events happened after that. Um, and so, like what you're doing here with the like, for example, um, you might have a bunch of. Form and then it was forty years ago, so eighteen by twenty twenty three, so eighteen forty three. Oh, fifty three. I can do math. Oops. Okay, I may have zoomed that out too far. Cool. Let's change this. Hey, mechanics. There we go. Um, so I'll just put the year in the. Oh, yeah. That's all I wanted to do. Good. Change the name here. Now we can see that is the <clears throat> that's the first event, which is the that, uh, and then basically you may want to say basically then eighteen eighty five. Basically, create another event. basically keep going through and essentially you keep you could build your basically your timeline of events that happened in the past so that you have a good handle of this was happening then this was happening and when basically while this was happening these things were happening because oftentimes there's a lot of there's a couple of different things going on so when your players come to you and they're like okay my character is going to do like research at the library and he wants to look up things in these dates, they want to look at these things, they want to they want to figure out what's going on um between these between these two time periods, you can give them a better basically by looking at this timeline here, you can have a better idea when you're describing it to them what events were happening at what time and basically when things were happening in relation to everything. Um however, the other thing you may want to do with a timeline is actually create essentially the in game timeline. Um, and what you may be using that for um, is you could you might be using that to deal with a couple of different ways you could use this is you could use this as a way of keeping track of exactly what events happen um, basically are happening in the world so you may have an in-game countdown as it were um and so you might have basically so at the start um basically you could have the death of the confession as the starting point and then you know that in seven days uh, do basically you could say the first Ritual victim dies. Um, and you could say that happens in seven days, and then second ritual. I keep trying to create new events there. Okay, there we go. Oops. I thought maybe I could with these. Let's do that there. Uh, and that happens in 10 days. 
And I'm just going to keep doing that. Event. My black stock starts dying. That happens in 15 days. And so you can keep Travis, you can set up this timeline in terms of, okay, for the moment that the death the deathbed convention happens, the players are on a timer. Um and in a certain number of days, um there's gonna you could you could start to have events happening that can push the players forward into realizing that things are happening. Um, and those that which makes those roles that the game makes you basically put hands out to you. Um, basically that's how basically Call of Cthulhu kind of puts the pressure on it. You're like, oh okay, yeah, you could you could you could totally get that box investigated. Um, you can't do it you you weren't able to do it yourself, but you could totally talk to this professor and he says he'll get it to you in and you roll a die and you say two days and so you could start a search basically so you could start adding in player events into here like box translated and you can say that happens on day five now you're starting to get this timeline building where you're like, okay, basically in two days, basically the players do something else, like, oh, we're going to go drive out to this part of town. Uh, we're going to drive to Boston, and basically because we could go follow a lead in Boston. Okay, that's going to take you because we're in the age of not instantaneous interstate travel and things like that. Basically, transportation might take you a little bit longer. You can catch a train there and a train back. Um, and so you are basically, and then you could be like, oh, basically you're keeping track of that and you know what's going on. And you could say, okay, this happens. And then you can have a note sent to the players saying so-and-so has died in a ritualistic killing. And the players be like, oh no, this things are getting serious. Things are starting to happen. We need to keep going. Things are happening. We are aware of what the timeline is. Or that we have be we're becoming aware that there's a timeline, and we know that we need to keep pushing it. Um, and this timeline helps you keep track of that. It also lets you do things like associate. You can create an interval. Um, and so for an interval, I could say this interval goes from zero to five. Um, we call that the session one, and so what that does basically is I could set that up so that uh, we have a, I have this first session here. Uh, there's basically, I've associated with that session. So if I go back to session, let me go in here. I've associated, basically I've associated a, basically in that's in game timeline, it's associated with the session one interval. If I go look that up. Um, I know what events happened during session one. Now, all of the events may or may not be apparent to the players. I could have hidden events in here, uh, which the players weren't aware of, like mysterious McSpooky um, basically has been, follows a player character and discovers that they're looking into the library or breaks into the hospital and basically steals the death, steals the death clothes of, of basically of the, basically of the Mer Merriweather or something like that. I can have all of those things in there so I can quickly look at this timeline and be like, oh, okay, what happened last? I can not only can I look at the completed events thing to tell me exactly what happened, I can look at the timeline to tell me when things happened and what ordered things happened. Um, and I can basically, I can keep track of all of that so I can use all of that information to essentially build up the world so that when they come back for the ses second session, I know what has happened. I know what they, but the players now can know has happened historically. I know how certain characters may have changed or not have changed. Like if someone gets replaced by their evil doppelganger, or if someone close to them gets threatened or they get threatened or something like that as the game goes on. And okay, so you waited until day seven to go talk to this person. Now their demeanor is different because they're basically they've been 
they've been exposed to this horror and so now they know this information or they have this kind of PTSD or something like that. Um, all of those things can be added up and you can keep track of all of those inside of here, inside of timeline, so that you could build, basically keep track of time and keep the pressure on your players to keep them moving forward without you having to flip back through a lot of notes and basically a lot of a lot of things and essentially having to draw this timeline out, out yourself in order to keep track of what's going on with your players between games and things like that so that you can quickly pick back up and keep going. Um, and it's especially helpful if you need to place something and you're like, oh, I need to, I, I want it to be after this, but before this. Uh, yeah, it happened. And you're having to guess, wait, was that three days ago or four days ago? You can look at it and be like, oh, I need this to happen between during the events of session one. Okay, that means it can happen between one to four days uh, after so-and-so died. I could pick a number from that and I could just go. Um, it makes my, it basically it makes your life as a keeper um, a lot easier from that perspective. Um, let's see here. Um, because, again, because a lot of this stuff is going to happen in uh, chunks and in sets. Um, basically, you're going to have one session, which may be all investigation, which your second one, then your second one might be um, basically more traveling and things like that. And then your third session might be the basically it tends to be the action session, as it were, or your let it say your third session, but your your final sessions tend to be a little bit more action oriented because things tend to come to a head, and player characters have to make choices and. People tend to die. It's called a Cthulhu. Um, not everyone's going to make it out alive, as it were. Um, so that's where you're keeping track of all of those secrets and things like that and timelines, and you're pushing for all of that to go forward. Um, for example, and this be one last thing we talked about, uh, basically being able to track locations and things like that. For example, a lot of the action in this one and that kind of end type situation takes place around a farmhouse. Um, and so using Lorelink, basically a lot of what we'll do with Lorelink is we will set up something like the farmhouse as its own kind of location in here. Um, and so you'll create a... You'll create a farmhouse location and maybe you'll basically associate it with the farmhouse map. Public visit, edge of darkness, farmhouse area, boom. And you maybe maybe you'll have some read aloud description of what the farmhouse looks like. Um, like that text. <coughs> oh, it's one of these one of these PDFs with random th. They use a weird font that that's a, they can't, that kind of clips together the t and the h. I don't know why. Um, but because of that, it tends to copy and paste as a weird symbol. It's a weird thing. Um, but uh, but you could you copy and paste the read description in there. Um, you also basically then you can basically you can also um, the reason why you want to really want to create that, and then you can make going to have separate areas underneath it, uh, like inside the farmhouse itself. You might have the attic. Cellar, and you might have the ground floor. So basically, now you have all those as children underneath the farmhouse. So that basically, you have the farmhouse, the attic, the cellar, and the ground floor. You can associate maps with all of those. You can basically using the tool we we showed last week. You can associate with the map. Um, you can highlight areas and be like, okay, this takes me into here or this takes me into there. Um, more importantly, uh, when you want to you set things up for the farmhouse in terms of you're wanting to keep track of certain things happen in certain areas or the players do certain things, that's what the child description is for. Uh, so that you can keep track of, basically, if the players do this inside the farmhouse, um, this sort of thing is going to happen to them. So basically, if you ritually chant this at any point in the farmhouse, they'll be attacked by that. Um, if the players look for this, they're more likely they're going to find it. If they have, 
they have flashlights, there is a 50% chance that the flashlights will fail anytime they go to turn them on when they're in the farmhouse area. Um, and you can add these notes in here. Oh, that is so ready. So now if I save that as a note for the farmhouse, if I go to the ground floor, look at details, I have this note there. The torches fail 50% of the time. I don't have to flip back and remember that. Uh, it's right here in the notes when I'm looking at it. Um, trying to think if there's anything else that is um, I need to call out about putting this together. Um, Not in particular, uh, let's see, we're a little bit early, but let's go ahead and start wrapping up here. So in terms of uh, how this is going to work, basically, so when you get done, basically you're going to put all this together, you're going to you're going to pull this in, you're going to get your players in, and you're going to use those sessions to uh, plan out your games, play through them, and you're going to be able to, while you're playing through the games, if something happens, which is basically what you need to deal with quickly, you can just quickly associate a new event. Uh, like police chase through the streets, move through Arkham. If your players, for example, did that, just so you have a note to yourself that, yep, that was something that happened. Um, because they went to the library and then stole a book or something like that. Um, you could keep track of that. You can also just add notes in here. You can have all of those available for you so you can quickly keep track of that and be able to come back and recap uh, between sessions and things like that. So, well, uh, thank everybody for coming here, watching, listening. Um, basically, what will happen is next week, assuming uh, every, all my players are available, uh, we will go ahead and start and play through the first of the, uh, let's say the first session of the uh, Edge of Darkness from the Call of Cthulhu starter set. Uh, we will basically we will see what our players get up to, whether or not they can withstand the horrors of 1920s of the 1920s uh, Massachusetts area. Um, given how well they've done with uh, dealing with traps and other stuff, it'll be interesting to see how well they can work together and keep going in a straight line to solve the mystery. But uh, that's the fun of role playing. You get to see discover. Uh, how different people act under different pressures and things like that. So um, come back next week, same time. Um, work together. Ha. Yeah, pretty much. Basically, same time, 5 o'clock next Tuesday. We will be starting through the actual play of that adventure. Um, I will be showing both the game as I run it in Roll20. Um, as Roll20 just have this module available. Um, and it will help with... Because, because all the players are relatively new to Call of Cthulhu, I don't want to basically giving them an automated system to work with is generally the better way of dealing with it so that they're not forced to completely learn everything new. Um, and they have some guides and basically things like that. So, But I will also have Lorelink open and available, and you'll be able to see it on the same screen. So you'll see me hop through... The events and keep track of things and add notes and things like that while we're playing um so you can see how i would use basically lore link in the actual play uh actual play session um all that said um thank you all for joining as i talked about earlier if you want to know more about lore link there are lots of different ways you can help us join us keep track of us if you want to watch for example if you want to be notified when we start that Lore link plays of this campaign next week. You can click the follow button right here on the stream, um, and that will alert you to when we are going live next. And it helps us as it lets us know that you are interested in following along. Um, if you are unable to catch that because life happens, uh, it will be archived on our YouTube channel along with all of our other previous Let's Plays. If you want to see some of Let's Plays, bleh, all of our previous actual plays. Uh, and planning sessions. Uh, you can catch those on the YouTube channel there. Um, and lastly, if you are a GM or a keeper or a DM or a storyteller and you wish to check into Lorelink and see how we can help you plan out your next campaign, 
uh, feel free, basically, if you go to the link, which will probably get posted in chat here shortly, um, basically, at our, or go to our website, you can sign up for our newsletter, which is where you find out all about the new exciting features which are coming out, or you can join the alpha itself and basically be able to take a look at the, take a look at it in action and uh, play, but the play along, yeah. You can, uh, Basically, you can set up your own sessions, things like that. Give us feedback so that we will know uh, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and we can hear from you and make changes to make this the best system for every every type of GM, storyteller, keeper, DM, uh, so that uh, we basically we can appeal to all types. Because as, we, as has been proven already this year, it basically you never know when you might need to suddenly change systems because maybe there's something problematic with the system you're currently running. Uh, so, in any case, thank you all for watching, um, and we will catch you all next week. Farewell.